So we welcome you to look at this particular topic, the shepherd crook. Uh, sheep were very important in the Middle East and of course we have a, a, a shepherd here who uh, is uh, really both of the shepherd and the sheep are very friendly. I'm sure there's a great picture too of the good shepherd uh, as well and his friendship for us and how he cares for the sheep. And so the reading there was in Psalm 23 and uh, of course the, the shepherd always had a crook, the shepherd's crook. And what was the crook for? Well, if a, a sheep or a lamb wandered off, uh, they would take the crook and they would take it, could t lift it out of a very bad crevice or a very bad place uh, by the crook and uh, take it back to safety again. And so it was very important, the crook, you know, to have that. So there's many descriptions of the shepherd in the Bible. What are the descriptions of the shepherd in the Bible? I don't mean a shepherd uh, of sheep, I, that is there of course, but also uh, the, the shepherd in capitals. Of course there's what? The good shepherd. And what else did we look at in Hebrews? The great shepherd of the sheep. And in Peter we're told about the chief shepherd. He's a Peter uses the term shepherd for pastor or shepherding, and uh, not uh, and uh, of course uh, Jesus Christ though is the chief shepherd, the one is the head over all. He is the head of the church, and of course uh, they were reminded of the story. He's a very personal shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, isn't it? The Lord is my shepherd, uh, uh, David, the psalmist David says. So he's mine, he's personal, very personal shepherd. Now, this uh, young fellow, he had a, he made a boat. He was a handy chap and he made a boat for himself. Uh, and of course, he enjoyed sailing his boat. It was great, but of course, the string broke and there you can see it's sailing off and uh, he's lost his boat. His boat got lost, and he was very, very sad that it was lost. He went home, and he lived in a town near the sea, and one day he was walking down the street, and he looked into a window, and there he seen his boat in the window. And he ran in and said, I, I want that boat, that's my boat, I want the boat, it's, it's mine, I made it, you know. And the man said, well, sorry. Someone brought the boat in and I paid them, I paid them money for it. And uh, uh, if you want that boat, you have to buy it. And he looked at the price. And he, shook, and he had to go and, and, and find the money for it. And he came back and he handed across the, the £2.50 or whatever it was, or €2.50. And the man took the boat out of the window and handed it to him. And you know what he done? He held the boat in his arms and he said, I made you and I bought you. You're twice mine. You're really mine. And isn't that a picture of what uh, Jesus has done for us? You know, he's our creator. And of course, he, he made us. And then he came to buy us back, paid the price of our sin. And when we come to accept him then, and he, he takes us in his arms and he loves us. Just like a shepherd would take his lost sheep in his arms to as well. So there we are. He's my shepherd. It's my boat. I made it and I bought it. I made it and now I paid for it. I bought it back again. And that goes the great story that, uh, you know, God the Father lost us and he sent his son to die for us. This is this great shepherd. And the provision, of course, then, not want. We we'll not want anything, you see. We we'll not have any need. We we'll not have any want. Oh, yeah. People may say, well, hmm, I want, I want, I want. But, you see, 
God will want to give you the best in life. And of course, he, he uh, doesn't want to give you things that will harm you, maybe not good for you, uh, but uh, he not want, not want is thinking here spiritually. Um, you know. Of course, it does say that uh, I've often been quoted in my young days, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the things that God will want for you. And, uh, and that's great, isn't it? You know? But seek first his will for your life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And then the picture, of course, uh, verse 2 there. Uh, the picture there in verse 2, isn't it? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Isn't that wonderful, isn't it? The picture there is of what? You know, you see animals, you see sheep when they're full and they're contented. You know, when I was travelling along on the train to, to see uh, Richard one time, I uh, saw animals feeding. They were really feeding, eating on the grass. And then I came along and I saw a whole bunch of animals and they were all lying down resting. And this is the picture here of those who have been full and resting, you know, in the, in the wonderful green grass and the feeding, speaking of feeding, make me lie down in the green pastures. So a place where there's lots of refreshing, lots of food. And God, you see, has lots of food for our souls. And lots of help for us, you know. And so, you want one? And, uh, you, and it's, it's, a, it's a picture of what? Rest and peace and contentment. And joy in your heart. That peace and joy, you see, you can have with Jesus. And, and that uh, refreshing and renewing of our souls, you see. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And that's the picture there, you see, you know, of that. Sheep lying, ruminating. You know what ruminating is? I'm sure you're a bit biological, and uh, uh, if I said chewing the cud, you might not understand that. But uh, ruminating, of course, is chewing the cud. The food goes down into one stomach, and then it comes back up again, and they chew on it. And that's the picture there, you see, ruminating, chewing. Are you chewing over God's Word? Are you, are you allowing this refreshing... The refreshment for your souls and thinking upon it. What does that mean for me? And how the benefit you see, and the benefit we get from it, then you see. That's what the, that's what the blessings to our soul. Because, yeah, we if we don't feed our bodies, we die. But if we don't feed our souls, yeah, we will not live with them. Not easy. It'll, it'll be a struggle. There'll be various problems, and so we need food for the soul, food for our daily lives, food. To build us up in the faith. And so it's a picture of those sheep lying, ruminating. Uh, and there they are together. And at peace. And happiness and joy. And that's the picture there, you see. Of those sheep in the meadow. Or wherever they are. Uh, doing that. There are these pictures through God's word. And there it goes. Still waters. Sheep will not drink from running water. They'll, they'll uh, want to still water. Quiet water. And, and the shepherd has to be there to stop the stream if it's running and making sure that it's still water. And of course, the Lord Jesus wants to refresh us. It uh, told the woman at the well, didn't he? That it was uh, the water he'd give him would be a well of what springing up to eternal life. You know, it's so wonderful. She thought, wow, that's great. You know, I won't have to come. I won't have to get that Irish water. That, uh, that Sumerian water, that water from Jacob's well. Ah, ah this will be great, you know. I won't be dry and thirsty again. And uh, that's so wonderful. But of course, he spoke of soul thirst. And we do need to thirst for the living God, don't we? That's a different thirst, isn't it? And so, there it is, the still waters. And uh, the restoration, verse 3. What is that again? He, lead, he restores my soul, you see, with all that. That's what it is, isn't it? 
He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Isn't that great? Leading us in the paths of righteousness. That's in God's way, you see. And this Jesus' righteousness, when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he credits us with his righteousness. Not our good works or our righteousness, which is filthy right. They are taken off and he gives us his righteousness. And then, of course, he leads us there in the paths of righteousness. So we have to go in the paths of that. Well, you know, should I go this way? Should I take that? You know, he's offering me those things. Should I take them? Uh, it may be free for the first time and after that, uh, oh no, I have to pay the next time. And then you get hooked on it and that would be so sad, wouldn't it? Our places we go to, that will not be good for us. And there it is. All right. And then of course there's the protection, isn't there? Yea, though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, this psalm is often used for a funeral psalm. It's a funeral, isn't it? Maybe there. But this particular uh, verse here isn't really talking about physical death. Well, it's in a way it is a bit, you know, but it's not quite. Yea, though I walk to the valley of death. It's talking about the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. You see, the shepherd often had to lead his sheep through very difficult areas and valleys. And some of those valleys where the robbers were and, uh, and where the wild animals were, it was through the, leading them through. Because the shepherd had to bring them through to fresh grazing and fresh ground and a fresh place. And he'd have to be watching them very much there at that point, wouldn't he? Because it was like the shadow of death. Anything could happen, you see, uh, uh, and the enemy could pounce. And of course, we have the enemy, our souls, they could pounce on us and get us, you know. Uh, and it's the valley of the shadow of death. And so we have to watch us. We have to watch that. But he, yeah, I walked through it. You see, we can walk through. God doesn't promise us, uh, you know, easy, easy, peasy life. He doesn't, uh, you know, it's not a, as they say, a bed of roses, but then roses have thorns, don't they? But uh, uh, there are the ups and downs in life, there are the challenges in life. And as uh, Warren Wilsby says there, the bumps are what we climb on. You know, if you had an easy life, I would say it was, I, I, I'd question, uh, you know, I, I'd be thinking about it. If, if the devil wasn't tempting us and, you know, bothering us, you know, if you have a uh, perfect life, talk to some people who are so, so perfect, you see, you know, so wonderful, you see, uh, they didn't hardly need to be saved, they had a perfect life, but you see, you know, the Christian life isn't like that, the Christian life has its ups and downs and challenges, you see, and, and uh, we can go through the various trials, but it says here, I will fear no evil. Isn't it wonderful to have God with us that time? To have him through the difficult times. To have him through the times when we... Yes, I don't know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. I just cannot understand that this is happening to me. You know, and yet, there can be a purpose. Will it build you up? Will it make you stronger? Will it make you lean more on Jesus? Isn't that what uh, my, one of my uh, great ones that talk, uh, uh, Johnny Erickson, says? She says, I wouldn't want to give up my wheelchair if it would make I'd lose my closeness to Jesus. Something like that, you know, you see. And that was great, you know, what, what, um, what she had learned, you see. Uh, a pastor who had read God's word to her and, and she worked through those things and she came to realise, you see, what God, how God was using her in the situation. It was very hard, wasn't it? To have a diving accident to have a, and then be a quadriplegic. I mean, well, she thought, that's it, life's gone, done. Uh, give me the tablets and that'll be the end of it. But, uh, of course, she couldn't get her hands on anything. 
And, uh, but God, because God had a purpose and he had friends that cared for her, you know. So the great protection that God can have through the trials, the protection for Johnny Erickson, the protection for each one of us through our various trials and problems. We could talk about things that happen in life and how amazing we can be saved from different things. You know, life is plain sailing. Well, it's not always plain sailing, is it? There's the waves, the bumps, and up and down, you see. It's not always plain sailing. It's nice, you know, but uh, there it is. And I would question someone if their life was a plain sailing, you know, because if when we come to faith in Christ, then the devil will attack. And there's no doubt about that, eh? If he doesn't attack, then it's... So life is plain, no, it's not plain sailing, is it, eh? Not easy. The shepherds uh, lose sheep, don't they? And, uh, they, of course, uh, Jesus does talk about in, in John chapter 10 that he lose none of them, you know. They're safe, they're, that's the security there, but the ordinary shepherd he will lose sheep, won't he? And, uh, a, uh, of course, uh, he, God doesn't want anyone to be lost. He wants them to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. You know. But uh, the shepherd's son was sick. This was the shepherd. It's the story of the Kerry boy, a true story. And John, a Christian worker, was asked to go to visit the shepherd's little place out in the hills in, in, in Kerry. And uh, he was very sick, and that's why the parents wanted to come. And as they knocked on the door and came in, and they brought him in, and brought to the bed, this young fellow had a raking cough. <laughs> he, he, he was just terrible, this, this boy. And he could have it. And he says, what happened? He says, you know, you're uh, living out in these hills. You'd be very healthy uh, and very... Uh, Good and strong and a yeah, big boy. Oh, yes, he says, so I was. Oh, I enjoyed these hills and were wonderful to that night. And he says, what happened? Well, he says, father came in with his sheep, checked, counted them, and there was one missing. And father, of course, uh, a human father retired, but... He, uh, he said, the son said, I'll go and look for the sheep. Of course it was a snowy night. There was a gale. It was fiercely cold. It was uh, way under, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, anywhere over t 10 or 12 degrees under. And, and it was fiercely piercing wind, uh, cutting into him. But he went on and on, up the hills and over, and trudging through the big deep snow. Then eventually he found the sheep, you know, and there it was, dead beat. And he says, I had to put it on my shoulder and bring it home that way. And what happened then, he says, when you, when you, when you go, oh, he says, they were all so happy. His parents and the neighbours and all were so happy that they found the sheep that was lost, but it was all night searching for that sheep. You know, it was very tough. And so he said that was he's so amazing, he says, and, and then of course John said, you know, he says that's very like he says, what God has done for us, what he's done for you. And so he told him about the lost sheep. What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness. And go out, go after the one which is lost until he find it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, I very much there. Wasn't it all acted out for this young fellow lying on his bed? Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons 
who need no repentance or doesn't see their need of repentance. And so that young guy there put his faith and trust in the Good Shepherd to save him, repented of his sin and asked Jesus into his heart and life. Didn't depend on just to be out working hard for his parents, for his father, but there of course he saw the gospel didn't be before him. He repented and trusted in the Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ and not long afterwards then the Good Shepherd sent his angel to take the soul of that young fellow up to be with him. And later the Good Shepherd took him up to heaven, safe in life and death. The promise, verses 5 and 6. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are thinking already about heaven. We are thinking about this house, the house of the Lord forever. Not the house in Jerusalem, not the temple, but the house of the Lord, you know. God's house, God's dwelling place. That's the real temple in heaven, you know. And so it's a great promise for us, isn't it? The preparation for the eternal dwelling. The preparation for to be in that place with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. And to be on, as we are reminded about the new heaven and new earth. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, like that young fellow with the rake and cough and pneumonia, whatever else set in, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Do you believe that? Will you lay hold on that? Because that's so wonderful, you know. In that same chapter it tells us about if any man is in Christ he's a new creation the old has gone the new has come and in my studies and looking at these things I often thought about that new creation do you know what it really means it really means to be made anew it really means to be made again it really needs to come back to the pristine condition, restored, original position, totally restored, totally renewed. If any man is in Christ, he's, he's a new creation, newly made. The old has gone, the new has come. And so that's so wonderful, you see, that God does that. And, and uh, that's his business. That's what he wants to do. It's not just to do to uh, give us, uh, make us feel a little better. But it's a total new inside. A total returning to what we should have been. Returning to what we lost in the Garden of Eden. Because Jesus loves us. He's a good shepherd. He's the one who made this world. He cares for you. He's God the Son. He loves you. And he's so concerned to find the lost sheep for his Father in Heaven. For his Heavenly Father. And so we... Thank you for the blessings that we can have from God and the hope we have. And so we thought about, didn't think that much about the shepherd's crook, but in ways he used it. The young fella didn't have a crook, but he had to put the sheep on his shoulders to bring it home. And so there it is. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. How wonderful wasn't it that the great psalmist of Israel, King David, during his life he thought about, and maybe there out, as he strummed on his harp, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. No want at all, he said, in care for him. What do we want? What do you want? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not live. And uh, so 
if you've been viewing, if you've been looking and managed to hold on to the end, we thank you for viewing. Thank you for listening. And we have the, the website open and running again, thanks to our friend uh, uh, Mr. Thompson, uh, Brian Thompson, who did a mighty work to restore it, to rebuild it again. It had to be rebuilt back to its pristine condition. And that was wonderful, wasn't it? So let's pray. Our gracious God, we pray that you will guide us. We pray, Lord, your hand upon us. We thank you for the message of the gospel. We thank you for the pictures we have in your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the good shepherd. We thank you for all the way you came. We saw how you came through uh, the cross uh, and the suffering and the pain and the anguish and the taunts and the jeers. And you did it all for us. And you came then to save. You came to save us. You are the good shepherd. And we pray, Lord, your blessing. We ask, O oh Lord, your hand upon us, and we pray, Lord, you indeed guide. We pray that many will know you as their personal shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead and guide in each one of our lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and for his sake and glory. Amen. Amen.